Welcome to the world this week. The war of words between the US and North Korea has reached a new high in recent weeks. So much so that Iran seems to have been pushed off the top spot to which George W. Bush allotted it when he called them part of the axis of evil. It's certainly true that North Korea actually possesses nuclear weapons, whereas Iran does not. So is the rhetoric justified? Are either or neither of these states near to launching a nuclear missile? Is it all jaw jaw or is there a real threat of war war? With me in the studio to discuss the issues are Paul Ingram, Executive Director of the British American Information Council, Nick Connor, Director of Campaigns for the Bow Group, and Lady Olga Maitland, Founder of the Defence and Security Forum. Welcome to the programme, all of you. So, um, there's been, Paul, there's been a bit of a sort of um, retreat from some of the, some of the more extreme um, threats here. South Korea had to back away from saying that there was an imminent test going on. So, so where do you think the situation actually lies on the ground now? Well, it's very difficult to say for certain, but I think that we are looking at the likelihood of some sort of a missile test in the next week or two. Uh, the North Koreans will be cautious about doing a test at this point, not simply because it will up the ante, but also because, um, probably more importantly, these, these missiles are not as accurate and as reliable as uh, some people fear, and that if they test it and it goes wrong, as most of their tests do, then it would look pretty bad from their perspective. So um, they are sitting there, I suspect, looking at the possibility of testing and wondering whether this is the right next step. If they don't test, it's very difficult to know where they go from here, because they have as you say, been threatening all this time. And, and when you threaten and you get nothing for it, you need some sort of face-saving face measure. And they haven't got any face-saving measure from anybody. So it's very difficult at this stage to know exactly what's going to happen. What we can say with reasonable certainty is that there is not going to be a nuclear uh, uh, launch anytime soon. Um, but, you know, given the consequence of a nuclear launch, saying one can say with reasonable certainty is not the same thing as 100% certainty. So we do have to be very worried about this situation. Mm. Uh, Nick, how do you see the background? What, what brought us to this point? Because there is obviously, you know, a, a ratcheting up of the tension. What, what do you see as the background causes? Well, you have to remember there's been sanctions on North Korea through the missile launches. Now, how I see this, this is North Korea sort of a new government, a new leader, trying to assert himself. He's out here to lay a marker down. So he's pushing up the banter, pushing his chest out, being a bit of a peacock, um, really trying to get a deal, um, trying to force maybe the American diplomats and the South Korean diplomats to bring some sort of sunshine diplomacy to drop some of the sanctions to keep them quiet. Lady Maitland, do you see this in, in that frame or do you see it as partly a response by the North Koreans to what have been an extensive series of military manoeuvres in March and April by the Americans in the area? I tell you what I find particularly intriguing is that we have a very young leader, he's still in his 20s. And I think, in fact, the whole exercise is actually an internal um, battle for power. And I think he's simply one element to it. I think he's got a very forceful aunt and uncle. He has there's a, an old apparatus behind him. And I suspect there is actually a behind the scenes jostling. And he's the fall guy in a sense. And therefore, all this posturing, because basically that's what we're looking at, is more a symptom of a domestic issue behind the scenes. Now, whether they'll make the ghastly miscalculation, I don't know. I suspect that my good friend is correct, that they do run a risk that this missile test could go wrong, because far too many have. So that is a bit of a problem. But broadly, all this kind of big posturing, telling foreigners to get out of South Korea because their lives are at stake, it's all really, I think, um, targeted at their domestic audience, and particularly perhaps within the inner sanctum. Mm. Paul, do you, do you take it that way? Do you think it is primarily an internal thing, or do you think it is partly a response to what have been huge military manoeuvres in the, in the area by the Americans? I think it's always very difficult to sit here in London and really predict exactly what's going on in Pyongyang. <clears throat> I think Lady Olga Maitland is correct to say that there is this internal challenge, internal problem, and, and that they need this internal legitimacy as a regime. I think to point to the 
to the uh, exercises is also correct. These are not inconsistent explanations. You know, if you are a regime that is unstable and, uh, and needing this legitimacy, and you have all your enemies uh, doing uh, these exercises on your doorstep, and you have been surviving for the last 50 years on a narrative that basically everybody, including the Chinese in more recent years, are out to get you, then having these uh, military maneuvers are going to put you on edge and create this sort of uh, crisis. But it doesn't explain the level of crisis that we've been seeing in the last few days on its own. And I, uh, so I agree with Olga when she talks about this internal need for legitimacy as well. I mean, Nick, let's move on to make some comparisons, as, uh, as I suggested in the introduction, between the situation with North Korea uh, and Iran. Um, do you think, I mean, nobody's going to go into bat for the, um, you know, the pleasantness of the North Korean regime, but it, just in a real politics sense, um, they've got nuclear weapons, they've faced down the West on a number of occasions, they've got some concessions, they were taken off the terror list in the mid-2000s. Um, uh, the Iranians must be thinking, well, you know, we're getting hammered for not having them. These people are getting away fairly lightly when they have got them. Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons at the moment. But by all study and all reasonable examination of Iran, they are trying to get them. Now, the way North Korea receive their nuclear weapons, produce their nuclear weapons, is very much the same way Iran is trying. Um, basically through a scheme set up um, by Dr. A.Q. Khan and his network, um, which was facilitated by the Pakistan government in the 90s by Bhutto's um, administration. Now, the way North Korea managed to get to the nuclear weapons was through trade through countries like China, where they was transferable. The reason why Iran has been unsuccessful is mainly because they don't have that friendship. Um, they're they don't have those allies to supply the goods. But they're certainly looking for uh, to, to get a bomb. And that's as big a threat, uh, if not bigger threat, if they were to actually get game one. How do you see this comparison, Lady well, Maitland? It's rather interesting. Uh, he's absolutely right. I mean, at the moment, Iran is trying to achieve a capability. They don't actually have it. Now, the official explanation is that they're enriching their uranium for medical research purposes. So, all right. It is interesting to note that they actually signed up to the Non-Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. Um, certainly Korea didn't do that, nor may I say did Israel, but that will come to Israel in a while. Um, my reading is this. From the conversations that I've had with Iranians, and I have to say I regret not in-country, they see the world in a different perspective. They see they're surrounded by enemies, a nuclear-armed Russia, nuclear-armed Pakistan, nuclear-armed India, nuclear-armed Israel. They see threats all around their borders. They don't have a history, actually, of uh, encroaching and annexing other countries. And when they had the Iran-Iraq war, it was Saddam Hussein who invaded them. So they have a slightly kind of paranoid view on the world. I think we're handling it the wrong way, but we might have a further discussion about this. My view is, is that we have pushed them into a corner we have actually locked them away from the world. The idea of real diplomacy seems to have been completely forgotten, particularly by the Americans. If you look at diplomacy in its correct form, it is a means of communicating with other countries, even if been your enemies for thousands of years. That's not, it is not judgmental to talk. Unfortunately, Washington and the State Department don't see it like that. They feel it's kind of surrendering to the devil. And that, I think, is a big mistake. In fact, if anyone could do a magical coup, it would be for Obama to lift up the phone and call up the leadership in Iran, as indeed he could do that in um, North Korea, if the report that we heard from the basketball player <laughs> has anything to go by. But I do sometimes think that creative, imaginative diplomacy has just been forgotten. And I think there are some big errors. Personally, I think the sanctions are making situations worse, not better. I think they're locking them away and they're putting them into a position when they're just going to fight like alley cats back. But we can talk further about this thing. But I have passionately against the idea of sanctions at all costs. I just don't think they work and I think they create more harm than good. Mm. I mean, Paul, if, if Lady Maitland's right, this is something which is frozen at the moment at any rate, not just into American policy, but into British policy as well. I mean, William Hague 
made a kind of, you know, um, bellwether speech a little while ago where he says there's a Cold War in the Middle East and on one side there's us and the Israelis and the Americans and on the other side there's the Iranians and the Syrians and so forth. So it's, uh, that, that's, a deep, that, that's a deep-rooted problem, isn't it? No. Yeah, but I think it's interesting you finish there with Syria because I think in there there is an opportunity. I think uh, if you go back a year or so, uh, th then the Iranians and the West were very much on opposite sides of that debate. But I think as things shift and move in the Syrian situation and uh, we become more aware of, the, of who it is that's in the opposition groups within Syria, I think there could be a shift in the relationship and the Iranians may start to see common cause with the West in, 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 in opposing some of the more radical elements within Syria. So I'm, I'm, I'm less... Uh, pessimistic about that sort of game. However, that's a side game. I think the real problem with Iran uh, uh, in the eyes of the West uh, and the, the core of this program, if you like, in comparing the two, is that uh, Iran is, is potentially a global player, or at least it's certainly a regional player, whereas North Korea is not. North Korea is basically a regime fighting for survival, and it's like um, it's using its nuclear weapons as a sort of gun against its own head to say, give us food or else we'll shoot. And, you know, the, the, the Chinese are busy protecting them because if they don't, then they'll have a huge migration problem on their border. This is about North Korea, it's not about the region. Whereas in Iran's case you have a government that is challenging the international community on, on the basis of legitimacy and fairness. And this hurts, it goes right down to the core of, of the basis of the international community. And what people, what many people in London and Washington worry about is that if you get a country that is challenging the international order as it exists today with nuclear weapons, they will be more effective in challenging that, that order. So nuclear weapons, as they have been in so many parts of history, are not just problems in and of themselves. They are tools for deeper games between great, great powers. And Iran is on the rise. It sees itself on the rise, and it sees potential relationships. So I would, my, my conclusion would be almost the opposite of Nick's, is that actually Iran's relationships uh, with the BRICS and with other up-and-coming countries are a source of challenge for the Western uh, Washington consensus. And as the power of the United States starts to wane and that of China starts to get starts to increase, Iran becomes a wild card. And this is very fearful for those within the intelligence communities and within governments of the West, because they actually see their unipolar control of the world slipping through their fingers. I mean, I mean this, this is the essential question with Iran, isn't it? And, and the thing that we haven't mentioned, of course, is that it's a, it's a consequence of the failure of US policy in Iraq. The one thing that wasn't supposed to happen after the Iraq war was that it made Iran willy-nilly uh, a stronger regional power than it was before. I mean, half the Iraq, current Iraqi government is pro-Iranian. That wasn't supposed, uh, supposed to happen. So, so really, nuclear weapons might be the causes belli, but the, but, but the real causes are, are, well, let's hope it's not a causes belli, but they are, they are only a symptom, let's put it, and the real causes are, are deeper in the, in the last decade's wars, really. Well, to say Iraq was a failure, uh, I wouldn't look at necessarily the government. I'd actually look at the outside world. You look at the Arab Spring, you're seeing people freer. And this is it's not necessarily through the military actions, but it is through trade and people becoming much more in touch with Western ideals, Western technology. Now, this is the real threat to Iran. And with their allies such as Syria, people begin to rise up. Now if this is where Iran could be dangerous, because they are, you say they're being more open, but in a sense, but more inner, because they're seeing Syria, they're seeing people of those countries rise up against these regimes. And that's what Iran is more threatened by. Yes, the government might be going out and trying to talk to some of the BRIC nations, but in a sense, the trade deals or the facility to make nuclear weapons, for example, are not coming from these BRIC nations at the moment. They're still at an arm reach. Mm. I mean, Lady Maitland, I mean, Paul was saying that, you know, that the, the different, one of the differences between the two situations is that there's, a, there's a, at least a regional and possibly a global implication uh, about Iran, um, Iran's rise to power, but that North Korea is about North Korea. 
if if that was true, do you think that it's possibly changing because the whole Pacific pivot, the redeployment of uh, of U.S. forces into the Pacific because of the rise of China, may mean that if that was true in the past, it may become entangled in much wider uh, parallel ground forces now? I think the big difference between uh, Korea and Iran is that Korea has no money. It's got no resources, much to speak of. Um, it is a poverty-stricken country, but it's a kind of a country locked in the past with having spent a huge amount of money on nuclear weapons, which gives him a role. Iran, on the other hand, is resource-rich, also educated and very sophisticated. And they are undoubtedly will be, if they're not already, a regional power. The question is, is how people perceive them. So if you, you're absolutely right, America is now tilting its access to Asia. And there are a lot of kind of understandable reasons. I think the other thing you've got to bear in mind, as Paul pointed out, America is now not the only game on earth as a superpower. They again have to jostle in with others. And therefore, it's quite interesting, for instance, talking about um, Iran is, is that there's a lot of kind of agreement between America and China, which hadn't been in the past. But what I feel is the big difference is that if something goes very badly wrong, I suspect that the fallout and the risks and the dangers are much more in Iran, because if Israel really runs away with it, they, I was disappointed that Obama's visit was so tame. I had the hoped that in his second uh, mandate, he would have had the courage and the independence to really fulfill what he started out to do when he first became president and to give the sense of fairness and just, uh, justice to the wider market. So now what happens? The Israelis are bunkered. They're backed up against a wall. They don't feel they've got a friend in the world. Therefore, of course, they're becoming even more dangerous. And they're the ones who've heightened the tempo about Iran and the possibility of getting nuclear weapons, quite ignoring the fact that they have an enormous capability of their own. Mm. But that's, quotes different. It's not different. It's actually deeply dangerous. And what worries a lot of observers, if they did, if the Israelis did the rogue attack, it wouldn't be the Iranians. Then, in fact, the spillout would be all affect the whole of the Middle East mm. and cause a huge regional damage. So the question is, can the Israelis be contained? And why is it the Americans are quite so kind of hidebound by public opinion on Israel? I had hoped again, second time round, Obama could have broken through the, all the political traditions in America about supporting Zionism and really try and take an objective stand. In fact, he missed his opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we've now got to wait probably another eight years before another president comes on board and we revisit it. So mm. the situation is quite volatile. The Korean story is very much the back door to China. China, of course, don't really want to see North Korea uh, unified with uh, South Korea. I'm not sure the South Koreans really want them, mm. um, but they do have a framework to do so. And even if they were joined up, actually, South Korea is a very motivated country with many of the same ideals and mindsets as China. Mm. So I think it's a different paradigm, really. Mm. And of the two, I think the Iranian thing is more volatile and dangerous. Mm. I, I mean, Paul, what do you think mm. got us to... Because the, the, between, the, between the sort of George Bush inclusion of North Korea in the axis of evil and now, it might seem that there's a sort of period of, you know, sort of linear continuity. But in actual fact, there was a move to a settlement. There was agreement about a framework for mm -hmm. unification. What happened to that? Well... <clears throat> It's very difficult to know because things move and they shift. And uh, a lot of the, that movement has happened uh, in North Korea. And we get and, and, and our interpretation of that is through a very, very um, thick lens, you know, so, so we put our own uh, interpretations on it. But my sense is that essentially they were never given a serious opportunity to climb to climb out. We, we, we gave them uh, food, we gave them oil. Um, but these were very short-term uh, uh, sticking, sticking plaster solutions. And, of course, the economy of North Korea is bankrupt. You know, there is no way in which they're going to climb out themselves. Mm -hmm. So they remain dependent upon the Chinese for pretty much their survival. The Chinese are backing them not because they particularly like the North Koreans. And, indeed, it's interesting to see there was an article in the Financial Times from, a, from somebody quite high up in the communist um, 
communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party recently, talking about how China is actually starting to have to worry about whether it should be related to this country any longer. Mm -hmm. Fifty years ago, you know, it's, it's all based upon a war that never stopped. But now there should be a fear in Beijing that if this country actually got a deliverable nuclear weapon, because we're not sure we have, they, they have one, will they be pointing it at Beijing as much as they would to any other country? So I think the Chinese are begin, uh, beginning to reassess. And this is the really, really big game. This is the really big game. The big game is the relationship between the United States and China. North Korea is not why the Americans are, are pivoting to Asia. It's, it's China all along the line and the Chinese relationship with India. You know, this is the great power relationship. Now, if, if uh, the United States can come to some sort of accommodation with the Chinese, then we actually face the possibility of global stability which is, you know, really quite powerful. But that will require the United States to change its attitudes on so many different levels <laughs> and uh, uh, take away this, this, this sense that so many on Capitol Hill in Washington have that America needs to remain pre preeminent pre -eminent and dominant. It is that relationship of domination that is felt across the world and in Beijing in particular that, that gets in the way of this potential stability. Um, I mean, you were saying that you know, perhaps there's now an eight-year period that we might have to wait until another American president can address the, the question of, of Israel and its relationship with Iran. But you know, politics, most difficult thing is timing, uh, obviously, but it doesn't look like anybody's got eight years in this in this frame, does it? Well, we've barely got eight minutes. Mm. Um, this is the, the, the tragedy of it. I have a feeling that the relationship on Iran, we're going to see the, it play out over the next few weeks. Uh, it's an internal, as far as I can see, it's, a, it's an internal struggle for power. And whether this young man will really continue to be the future leader, I have not a clue. I think it's, we're more likely to see an implosion in North Korea. And what we're seeing now is kind of a rhetoric in a theater. It's quite interesting to observe that the South Koreans are amazingly calm. Um, you know, anyone who's tried to do a vox pop on the streets or say, oh, find everyone's carrying on about their business totally normally and rather laughing at the, uh, the rhetoric. But you should never laugh at that rhetoric because they have actually They've knocked planes down, they've shot at boats, you know, they have actually done some quite dangerous uh, action. I think it's quite right that the international community have been very restrained. I think it's quite right that Seoul has been very restrained. I think it's the only way. You're watching a, a country going through a very, very difficult domestic turmoil. And um, I think the reaction on China is extremely important. And the fact that they themselves are now getting rather tired of their neighbor, um, shows a, a fascinating lineup, and I, I absolutely agree with you. I think we're seeing a new paradigm. Uh, Nick, briefly, we're coming towards the end of the, the program now. Um, but but do, you, do you agree with Lady Maitland that, uh, that the sanctions regime is, is unhelpful in terms of coming to a, a settlement with Iran? Um, I think the biggest weapon the West has would be trade. I think a bottom-up approach. We want to empower the people of Iran. Now, sanctioning them and starving them is probably not the best way to do that. If we have mobile phones, we have Western television, we have... The Cold War wasn't won by starving the Soviet Union or shooting at the Soviet Union. It was won by genes and Hollywood. If we empower people to go out there and, in a sense, carry on the Arab Spring, I think we will see um, a, a bottom-up people, you know, taking on the Iran regime. But let's just, you know, let's be clear about this. You know, Iran at the moment is a danger to the West. And this, there is this instant, well, what are we going to do about it? We need to sanction them. I think that's uh, a wrong way to go, but they are scared. OK, well, I'm going to have to stop you there because that's all we've got time for in the first part of the programme. But in the second part of the programme, we will be looking at the situation in Egypt and the progress of the uh, Arab Revolution in the Middle East.